When I tell you Simon Stallenhog's The Labyrinth is a maze you'll never escape, I don't think I'm exaggerating. A sci-fi horror art book where a mysterious phenomenon turns Earth into a world of ash and decay, the setup seems simple. Likewise, the characters, a trio of survivors journeying across the wastes, seem easy to relate to. Yet the deeper you venture, the more you realize the labyrinth is a complex tangle of secrets, mysteries, and revelations so gripping that it never truly lets you go. So, for this entry into the archive, we'll attempt to decipher this masterpiece of dark world building. And like my videos on Stallenhog's other series, you can purchase the art book using the links in the description. Now, let's enter the maze of the labyrinth. The end of the world begins with a whisper. Mysterious black globes appear in the sky one day, their arrival so subtle and quiet it is at first thought to be some sort of natural cosmic phenomenon, as if Earth has simply drifted into an unknown part of the galaxy. Yet the spheres seem to move in formation, gliding through the landscape like they're following a coordinated plan of action. And soon, planet Earth begins to wither, the atmosphere growing toxic over a timescale of decades. It is a chillingly subtle apocalypse, slow and almost imperceptible. All attempts to destroy the globes prove futile, with military crafts left warped into dreamlike spirals of matter, as if space itself has been twisted. Rendered completely inoperable, these misshapen weapons lie forgotten in fields alongside all hope of defeating the spheres. The apocalypse in the labyrinth is so far beyond human comprehension that the narrative could be classified as cosmic horror, a genre that extracts terror from the unknowable and otherworldly. The black globes cannot be reasoned with, rationalized, or removed. They are utterly insurmountable, an astronomical nightmare that humanity has no hope of escaping. Each player gets two completely different mazes! The profound helplessness that incomprehensible phenomena instill can be better understood in conversation with the film The Endless, another work of cosmic horror that follows a cult which has emerged around a mysterious, reality-bending entity. Like the threat in the labyrinth, the entity in The Endless is subtle and insidious, only perceptible in the elusive ways it warps space. Yet the dread it conjures is palpable felt in scenes where cult members play tug-of-war with an unseen force in the sky, or when three moons rise overhead, a visual that like the black globes of the labyrinth conveys the celestial scale of the threat. The first one to get through the maze with all three balls lights up the tower! Over a decade after the globe's arrival, the sun, appearing faint and green through an ammonia-choked atmosphere, rises over a landscape of ash and ruin. Only a small population of humans avoided the extinction that befell the vast majority of life on Earth. Yet it is in this era of dust and decay that the primary narrative of the labyrinth begins. Three protagonists set out across the desert in a research vehicle. Two are siblings and employees of Kungshal, an underground facility that is one of the last safe havens for humanity. The third is a child and former refugee the siblings took in during the crisis years. All three carry with them dark secrets from before civilization's fall. The trio journeys towards an uninhabited research outpost, the siblings hoping a break in routine will help the child, who has been showing signs of acute psychological distress at Kungshal. They also plan to conduct some light research on the changed surface. After all, such expeditions are common and should be perfectly safe. Yet there are other things in the otherwise barren landscape, things that don't resemble life on Earth yet seem to be alive all the same. Answers to what these entities are and why they seem so at home in an otherwise apocalyptic biosphere can only be found by venturing deeper into the labyrinth. After a long drive across the somber mesas, the trio at last arrives at the isolated outpost. 
Although half buried in dunes of ash, the vacant station represents one of the last safe environments in the age of the globes. And yet while the interior is protected from dust and ruin, the environment doesn't feel safe. In the garage, a mural depicts dandelion seeds blowing in the wind, a visual so incongruous with the apocalyptic reality of the planet it becomes almost eerie. This uncanniness only grows more intense deeper within the station, where objects remain stacked in neat rows. There's a sense of desperation in these scenes, the impossibly clean interiors a way to pretend that nothing beyond the facility walls has changed. As a result, common objects take on a cadaverous quality, stuck in time like insects trapped in amber. The feeling of falseness can be so extreme, these interiors can seem more hostile than the barren desert outside, an environment that, while far from pleasant, is at the very least straightforward. The uncanniness that these altered interiors exude isn't easy to put into words. Compared to your typical sinister locale, nothing about the research station is overtly menacing. And on a cultural level, we all know what a creepy interior is supposed to look like. There's usually cobwebs and spiders, gothic hallways with dim lighting and long shadows, the perfect stage for something to pop out for the inevitable scare. The Overlook Hotel from The Shining isn't dark or cramped or run down. It's a bright, spacious, clean venue. Yes, it's haunted by the dead, both metaphorically and perhaps quite literally. But as a hotel, it honestly looks nice. Yet through the eye of director Stanley Kubrick, the building feels… unwell. Everything from the dizzying patterns on the carpet, to the queasy colors of the rooms, to the sheer uncanniness of spaces meant to hold thousands more people than the three main characters broadcasts a sense of… wrongness, for lack of a better word. As the leads become increasingly psychologically distressed, the unfriendly setting feels like a reflection of their growing mental unwellness, and perhaps even the cause. It's fitting, then, that the facility and the labyrinth mirrors the Overlook Hotel, both in its unnerving aesthetics and disturbed occupants. For like the characters in The Shining, the three leads in the labyrinth are haunted by ghosts from their past, pushing them to the point where they seem genuinely unstable. Although for much of the narrative, it's difficult to determine which characters are dangerous and which are in danger. At the end of The Shining, lead character Jack Torrance reaches a point where he tries to hunt down his family with an axe. It's a looming potential outcome that stays with you as you read through the labyrinth, and wonder how dark things will get before you reach the center. Dig Dug digs his own mazes. He digs for balloon men. He digs for dragons. As a suffocating tension builds within the station, the brother and sister continue to make daily expeditions into the surrounding wasteland to study Earth's new environment. And in the emaciated remains of what was once a city, new forms of life have arisen. Amongst the wreckage, gargantuan stationary organisms sprout from the ashen sand like enormous fans of coral. These life forms seem at home in the new climate, as if the globes have terraformed Earth to match the biosphere of their place of origin. Yet these coral specimens are just the beginning. Deeper within the maze of the city, tremendous stalks grow inside the husks of buildings, having infested the structures like hermit crabs occupying a shell. The tops of these stalks stretch towards the diffused green light of the sun, the scene evoking a photograph taken far below the waves. Imagery reminiscent of the deep sea appears throughout the labyrinth, with the suits needed to survive on the surface evocative of not just astronauts, but also old-school divers. There's a sense of incompatibility that the land has become as unsuitable for human life as the deepest oceanic trench. Elements of cosmic horror once again rear their heads in these scenes, as the siblings are utterly unable to explain the phenomena around them. In one image that didn't make it into the final art book, a mysterious squid-like creature spreads ribbon-shaped tentacles throughout the city. There is no understanding this new environment. There is only danger. 
In this respect, The Wasteland is resonant with the shimmer from the film Annihilation, a psychedelic region that an alien entity transforms into a new ecosystem. The shimmer can be deadly for humans to traverse. Yet like Earth in the Labyrinth, the Shimmer isn't devoid of life. Instead, it's overflowing with new types of organisms. In fact, it's left ambiguous if the force behind the Shimmer even comprehends that it's causing harm, an ambiguity that extends to the Labyrinth. Although little comfort to the survivors, there is a possibility the near extinction of humanity was just an accident, an unintentional byproduct of some unrelated operation. The new world might be toxic to lifeforms adapted to the old one, but clearly some entities prosper in these new conditions, growing to colossal sizes. Perhaps whatever intelligence is behind the changed biosphere thought only of the benefit to themselves, and never factored in the suffering of others. Yet the creators of the Black Globes are not the only faction in the labyrinth that made callous calculations to survive. The city is haunted by organic detritus, but also the wrecks of giant armored drones, employed by the military police during the crisis years. And these destructive weapons weren't just aimed at the globes. And now he's digging his way into homes everywhere. Later in the labyrinth, we learn that in the years leading up to the surface becoming completely uninhabitable, panic and desperation spread among civilians. The air became difficult to breathe, and refugees urgently sought shelter from the sphere's toxins. Rumors of Kungshal, a hermetically sealed city with room for only 100,000 inhabitants, spread to the desperate masses. As a carefully constructed micro-ecosystem, Kungshal could not hope to shelter the many needy people who sought refuge. And so, the protectors of the facility, the siblings included, made a grim calculation. One they'd spend the rest of their lives trying to justify. A massive quarantine zone was erected around the site, with heavily armed guards and robots patrolling the border. All possible threats to the project were annihilated. In order to save humanity, the employees of Kungshal believed they needed to be inhumane for a period of time. The strategy was simple. Deterrence. Methods of instilling fear by any means necessary became common practice. There was no official name for what the guards of Kungshal were doing. No name was needed. And in many respects, the plan was a resounding success. The streams of people seeking safety diminished. The message had been received. Whatever misery the survivors were fleeing from, something much worse awaited them at Kungshal. Yet cruelty does not vanish. It lingers festering in the souls of those who wield it, and in those whom it is wielded against. Among the refugees who suffered at the hands of Kungshal was the child the siblings would later take in, a decision they made to ease their guilty consciences and forget the darkness of their past. But what some seek to forget, others shall always remember. They think I'm trapped, but I'll escape. Tunnel Runner, the new video game where you don't look down on the maze. You're in it. Monster! The people in the labyrinth are a tangle of moral complexities. Knots you turn over and over in your head as you try to unravel them, struggling to reconcile their many contradictions. The characters themselves seem lost within their own memories, unable to decide the right path forward. This conflict is represented by a maze that comes from a computer game the child plays, which grows larger and larger as the story reaches its climax. There is a literal maze at the heart of The Shining as well, an immense expanse of hedges that dominate the local grounds. For a film known for its puzzle-like storytelling, it seems like a logical inclusion, Yet as is the case in The Labyrinth, the maze in The Shining is also symbolic of the psyche of the main characters, in particular Jack Torrance in his descent into utter madness. Perhaps the greatest mystery of The Shining is the source of Jack's insanity. Is it something he brought with him, as the film implies he abused his spouse and child in the past? Is it symptomatic of the hotel itself, a seemingly hostile locale? 
Or is it something beyond comprehension, the scheme of an otherworldly entity we can't hope to understand? This plot point acts as a prism, with the refracted truth appearing differently to each member of the audience. The ending of the labyrinth is just as multifaceted. In fact, it might be more so. Because in The Shining, out of the three lead characters, there's at least a distinct villain in the form of the axe-wielding Jack Torrance. But the labyrinth has no villain, not really. Just people who had to make terrible decisions and people who can't let go. And while you hope they'll be able to escape, to find a way out of the maze they've all trapped themselves in, there's no exit in sight. Famously, in the final scenes of The Shining, Torrance becomes lost within the very labyrinth that represents his winding path towards insanity. The film ends not with the red-hot swing of an axe, but a long, slow fade-out as he succumbs to the cold of a snowstorm. The blizzard an apparent reminder that there are far more powerful and elemental forces at work in these stories than humans. The labyrinth ends with a flood. The ammonia in the atmosphere falls like rain and dissolves the water frozen under the ash, a final, unexpected stage of the changing earth. The dark liquid wells up in the interior of the station, drowning the red corridors. And in the midst of this catastrophe, the pressure building within the lead characters finally bursts in a way I found both shocking and somehow completely inevitable considering all that came before. While I won't give away all the final twists and turns to the labyrinth, if you'd like to know everything that happens, you can check out the book for yourself. Better check them out. It's the exit to another maze. The labyrinth doesn't exist in a vacuum. Simon Stollenhog's other works, Tales from the Loop and the Electric State, explore related themes of bureaucratic inhumanity and lingering trauma through a lens of visually stunning sci-fi. Yet though both of the aforementioned works have their serious elements, I believe The Labyrinth is ultimately Stollenhog's most solemn story yet, one I still feel a part of me is trapped within. While all narratives have to come to an end, the mysteries and tragedies of The Labyrinth lingered long after the final page, which is a testament to the story's strength. All of Stollenhug's futures are worth experiencing, and if you find these worlds as interesting as I do, you can purchase the art books using the links below to get the full narratives, and follow Simon Stollenhog on social media. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.